We're going to transition to our second group of TED speakers, but uh, I thought I'd say a few comments uh, based on what Lou Friedland mentioned with the new scholars coming into UW. Oftentimes what we hear is that young, early career people want to come to UW because of their interest in the Wisconsin idea and public scholarship. Yet at the same time, we often hear from people going up for tenure that the perception is that uh, public scholarship, engaged scholarship is not valued or rewarded or recognized at the same rate or with the same uh, level of uh, respect as perhaps more of a, a bench science, a classic science. And what Lou pointed out is something that's hugely important. I think with the help of the Mortgage Center historically, current, the Mortgage Match, and many people across campus who are working on tenure processes, uh, we're really, I think, tackling this whole issue of pre-tenure engaged scholarship. And it's something that I think there's a bright future for on our campus as we uh, have a new chancellor come on board. I think these are great topics of conversations. There are other universities who are ahead of us. Some are behind us. But I think collectively we're going to be seeing engaged scholarship as the way of the future in part, and I'll speak on this behalf of the medical sciences, many of the national um, agencies that are funding medical research, NIH, NSF, have it as a requirement for broader impacts that engaged work must be considered when proposing any new uh, research at the universities. So I think this is going to be the way of the future, and I really hope that this is going to expand our efforts, and forums like this are very critical in raising awareness. Okay, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce, introduce our second round of TED speakers. Uh, we have four uh, talks slated for this next round. Our first speaker will be Paul Robbins. Paul is the director of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and a professor of geography. Uh, his talk will be on the Community Environmental Scholars Program. And Paul is fairly new to campus, about a year here um, and into his position. Our next speaker will be Carmen Valdez, who is assistant professor Department of Counseling Psychology in the School of Education. And Carmen will be speaking about family-focused intervention for Latino families affected by parental depression, a community collaboration. Our third speaker will be Randy Stoker, uh, who is professor in the Department of Community Environmental Sociology and also in Extension. And Randy will be speaking about action research for the Funding Commons, a partnership with community shares of Wisconsin. Our fourth speaker will be Boyd Rossing, who is the PI on the project. He is a professor emeritus in the School of Human Ecology, and he will be speaking about service learning enriches UW tutors and larger families uh, in the Larger Families Partnership. He will be accompanied by uh, today by three additional presenters. I think all of them are students. Uh, Marion Slaughter, who is a graduate student in curriculum instruction, Chloe Brown, who is a UW senior, and Monique Bryson, who is another graduate student uh, at UW. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. And Well, as the director of the Nelson Institute for only seven months, I am uh, the proud PI of what's going on here, but uh, <laughs> truly, uh, but much of the work and the, uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that has made this such an enormous success precedes me. In particular, I'd, I'd want to call out the, the interim director, Greg Mittman, but also Molly Zwayback from uh, the Community Environmental Scholars uh, Program, and Rob Beatty, who's here, who will probably be taking questions. In 2010, uh, the, the Institute wanted to diversify its student base. Uh, environmental studies is, in, on many campuses, a historically skewed community. And we were interested in students of color, first generation students, returning adult students, and Wisconsin resident students who had been historically underserved and underrepresented in environmental studies. So Greg Mittman, working with Molly Zwayback, led a team to develop what's called the Community Environmental Scholars Program. And it sought these new students through a scholarship uh, program externally funded that would provide students a service learning opportunity and a seminar to synthesize the experience, intensive, high-touch advising, maintaining relationships, cohort-based experience, and the provision of career development and internship opportunities. But they wanted to expand that. And they wanted to expand that to give that opportunity across the curriculum and to, uh, to Nelson students uh, more generally. 
and tapped a, a matching grant proposal uh, from the Mortgage Center for Public Service. And that proposal sought funding for teaching assistants to develop community-based service learning capstone courses open to everybody. That's the model. It included funding for internships and other support for students who were interested in linking their passion for the environment with engaged environmental scholarship. And Mortgage funded the proposal and combined with support from another uh, donor, Char uh, Charlotte Zeev, we created an annual service learning course competition. It's called the Zeev Teaching Assistantships. Um, this allowed the Nelson Institute to transform, basically transform the number and types of capstone classes it was offering to undergraduates. Fundamentally, in some ways, change the undergraduate curriculum and move it towards engagement. So now we have a full program, which includes the Community Environmental Scholars Seminar, which links environmental studies to specific community engagement activities I'll talk about a service learning capstone course for all our new undergraduate majors. The major is about a year and a half old. We have 600 undergraduate students. They take the major as a second major. Paid internships that allow us to place students directly with community partner organizations, although we also have unpaid internships. And mortgage support has been truly transformative in that sense. What has the CSP program in the Mortgage Center meant for the students? We've got 79 total students from fall 2010 to present that's passed through, and all of them have performed community service projects, gotten professional training, and most importantly, they've learned how their academic training in environmental studies can connect them with the work of, and the ongoing work of community organizations. And I should say that these were not um, paratroop in relationships with the community. These are longstanding relationships that pre-exist, but really want, really desired a, a higher student presence and, and needed uh, boots on the ground. So this is a, about sustaining relationships that are ongoing in some, uh, in some meaningful way. The Mortgage Match has allowed us to develop uh, 11 new service learning capstone courses. That's 160 students. I would point out that that touches in a lot of different ways. The students are in communities uh, and, and working with community organizations, as I'll discuss, but the TAs, these are graduate research students who are developing the opportunities, working with faculty and ongoing uh, uh, community relations, so it's that cascading effect. You'll see uh, faculty working with TAs to develop capstone courses for undergraduates working in grade schools around uh, environmental uh, service learning, so that's pretty awesome. I, I came here because it existed, you know? Um, 9,200 total hours of service, uh, so uh, we're just getting off the ground, but there's a, there's a lot of time in with these communities, and I think it's really great, and these students are, are, are uh, face forward. Let me give you two case examples. Um, uh, these are just scratching the surface. L uh, Lizzie Needham here, who was on uh, your right, uh, wrote a Mortgage Center Wisconsin Idea Undergraduate Fellowship proposal to offer after-school environmental programming at Sp uh, Spring Harbor Middle School. She won the award and has recruited dozens of other Nelson undergraduates to help develop educational activities uh, with the students of Spring Harbor. This semester, she's working with the Mortgage Center's We Badger volunteer program to increase the number of UW students involved. So it's had a snowball effect well beyond CESP, well beyond Nelson. It's, it's a really broad Wisconsin uh, experience for lots of undergrads and hopefully lots of schools. Oh, I'll come back to that. Michael Geiger, a graduating senior, developed an environmental partnership in Park Falls, Wisconsin. I don't know if you know the industrial landscape of Park Falls, but what you got there are a lot of paper mills. Um, brilliant program. What he's done is taken the paper mill's excess steam to heat community greenhouses, which is bloody brilliant. So the Community Growing Center is what it's called, plans to provide healthy organic food, gardening training, K through 12 environmental education opportunities at this facility, all tied back into uh, to this industry that has historically had complicated relationships with the community and the environment, I should say. Michael says he would never have dreamed up this project if it hadn't been for the kind of support that he received through Nelson Mortgage and CESP. We've worked with nearly 30 community partners in Madison, Milwaukee, and a few others. There are too many to call out, but many of them will be familiar to you uh, as important organizations in and around the region. Uh, I've talked a lot about undergraduates in terms of value for students, but I do want to stress that mortgage funding has helped give this community-focused graduate student opportunity to develop and teach service learning courses, courses in this capstone, and we really think that that's a, like the seed of a much bigger idea, which is to take research students who may otherwise be buried in a lab and have them be developing questions in concert right, with community partners. It's not a new idea, but it's one certainly that is underdeveloped uh, within, uh, with our own PhD program, and I certainly see some opportunities. We were thinking of calling it Nelson Core. A value added for the community? And needless to say, we're engaged with more regularly and effectively with our community partners, and I, I say this in, insofar as I believe Nelson has a very long and rich 
relationship with community partners, but not one can sustain all the time. And I think it makes a big difference to have those, uh, those student engagements that are really are the grease that continues to turn the wheels of connection. In terms of value added for Nelson, the mortgage grant has made a hugely successful program. Uh, beyond that, though, we've doubled down. Rob Beatty, who's here, wrote a grant with Kathy Middlecamp uh, for $600,000 from the National Science Foundation for CESP students for STEM disciplines. So there's some, a lot of add, value added on uh, snowballing in terms of support. And we were able to get a further supplemental gift from Charlotte uh, Zeev and the Zeev family to maintain even more of these TA positions. In fact, we have so many of them, we're, we're, we're beating down the bushes to get them out to students. So come see me. And finally, uh, we've got de now have dedicated academic and outreach staff. I'm almost done. Outreach staff support for students and community engagement activities, which would have been, I think, very difficult to have imagined maybe five or seven years ago. I defer to Rob. You've been here that long, right? Would have been harder to imagine. And that, that's really important. And we've incorporated community engagement principles into the curriculum. So that's also, it was lucky because it coincided with the development of the undergraduate major. Right when Greg and his team was writing the major, the, the money and the opportunities and the students were coming on board. We, could, we didn't have to retrofit anything. We could build it from scratch. I don't think we got it perfect, but we got it good. And it really was a happy, uh, not quite an accident, but it was a happy uh, serendipitous coming together. CSP students are becoming uh, community leaders. And I do think that in terms of recruiting core faculty and directors to a place like Wisconsin and the Institute, people like, um, well, Lots of people. Uh, <laughs> we don't recruit a lot of people because we don't have a lot of money. But people are coming into people are coming into the institute as our affiliates and as core faculty, and I think they're attracted because I think the service learning thing is under their skin. And I, I want to reiterate this point that it has also helped. It helps us cement the argument that this should be part of a promotion and career path for faculty and graduate students. And for a, for somebody in my position as a director, the momentum behind this makes that argument very, very easy, or much easier, so that you can see a reward structure for people who are working with the communities in their science as part of what they're doing. And I'm really proud to hopefully move the football a little further on this with the help that we've received from uh, both the community and Mortgage. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carmen Valdez, and I'm an assistant professor in counseling psychology. And I am one of those early career scholars that is hoping that my engaged scholarship will help me in the tenure process, as it will be decided next month. <laughs> Not nervous at all, by the way. Uh, today I will be talking with you about a program that I have uh, developed along with students, many students here at the University of Wisconsin, the program is called Fortalezas Familiares, which means family strengths. And it's a family intervention for immigrant families in the Madison area um, when um, mothers have been in treatment for depression. And that's the intervention is at the family level. And I'll give you some background about the intervention first. The reason why it came to be is because research shows that depression is not only um, common among women, but also among women living in poverty. And furthermore, for immigrant women, um, there are other vulnerabilities that increase their, their rates of depression. Some women, when they come to this country, they leave other family members behind, such as children, uh, parents, in the hopes that they will be here, will make enough money to return in a couple of years, and find themselves 15 years later not being able to reunite with their child or with other family members, and, and this is a sense of loss that is very difficult for them to overcome. And for other women, even as they, if they bring their children with them, they begin to experience a sense of disconnection. As their children become more and more immersed in US culture and language, the parents really struggle to connect with their children and even to speak the same language. And furthermore, many immigrant families also struggle to incorporate into society in the ways that they had hoped to. So uh, what that does is that it really shows that when a parent copes with depression, it's necessary to treat the parent's depression, 
but it's not sufficient in protecting the needs of families. And in fact, what, what research shows is that when a mother has depression, um, children experience long-term negative outcomes, including behavioral difficulties, emotional um, problems, as well as academic and occupational difficulties. And these persist pretty much into adulthood. So uh, this project is a community-based intervention. We've been working with community partners, as well as um, many students, both in the School of Education, as well as from um, social work. And the project is a pilot study to, to evaluate the feasibility and acceptability, and as well as some of the preliminary outcomes of the intervention so that we can plan to take this on, on the much larger scale in the future. And in addition to um, me, I would like to acknowledge Sandy Magaña, who uh, was an associate professor in the School of Social Work, and she was a co-investigator in this project, and she is now at the University of Chicago, Illinois in Chicago. And this project was primarily funded by the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research here at the, at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, and also supplemented with mortgage matching funds. And when you have a project like this that, that entails uh, the delivery of psychotherapy, you really do need many uh, people to be involved. And I've been just blessed to have worked with, I would say in the entire period, to have worked with over 25 students here at the university who have been in touch and have been exposed to working with these families and in developing the intervention. And, but at any given time, there were approximately 12 students involved in the project. And the majority of these students are from counseling psychology, some um, students from the School of Medicine and Public Health, as well as others from social work who've been involved. Um, these students are very interested in community work. And in fact, the student in the black shirt that you see in that picture, he is currently conducting his dissertation in Guatemala and is doing his work on the effects of deportee family separation on their adjustment back into Guatemala. And so these are students who have a very deep commitment to uh, social justice and multiculturalism and who learn by doing and by being immersed in the community that they serve. And um, I also want to point out that this project has attracted a significant number of ethnic minority students. 75% uh, of students involved in the project were Latino, and which was a real asset for the project as well because of the, the language piece. And these students have been involved in all aspects of the project, from conceptualizing it to adapting the intervention, developing the, the implementation, the procedures for it, working with families, being therapists. Um, some of them have also been helping by serving food to families or, or doing the kinds of things, the behind the scenes that make all of this happen. And uh, we conceptualize this project as a true community collaboration. So what that means is that we can't do this work without having key leaders um, advocate for us and provide that transition from being an academic to being in the community. So we worked with mental health clinics, or a variety of health clinics, the, most of them were mental health clinics, and one was a primary care clinic. And we relied on them to provide us with referrals of their adult clients with depression. And um, again, it would be very difficult for us to reach, to reach this population as academics um, so it's important for us to go through these uh, people who are already trusted in the community. And then the other sense of it being a community collaboration is that most of you are familiar with the current mental health system in that it really fails to address the needs of, of families. Uh, mental health services are primarily provided to the individual patient or client, and it's, in most cases it's in the form of medication therapy. And so what we wanted to do by partnering with these clinics is to also help them think differently about how to work with their adult clients with depression. 
and to really adopt more of a family-centered approach. So what we did is we would go to their clinics and we would uh, give presentations about family, uh, working with families, the needs of families when a parent is depressed. And we also had um, sponsored experts from all over the country to come to the university and speak about their work with the Latino community. And we invited our partners to come and be part of that so they could as well learn from that experience and be able to go back to their clinics and do uh, or their work in a, in a much more holistic, family-focused manner. And then we also um, invited a community clinician to be one of the facilitators so that we could both learn from her experience and her familiarity with the families, and as well as for her to go back to her work and beyond the project, be able to work with families in a more um, systemic manner. Uh, the project or the program consists of 12 sessions. Um, it has groups for parents, which is the mother with depression, as well as other family caregivers like fathers or grandparents, other family members involved. And, it, and then also groups for children, and the parents meet separately from the children, but then towards the end of the program, there are family meetings where they come together and talk about their their hopes for the family and their concerns in a supportive manner. Um, the goals of the program are for families to really reach a shared understanding of depression and how it's affected the family and how the depression has also resulted from difficult family experiences. And also for parents to increase their sense of competence and confidence about their parenting practices and for children to build stronger, more effective coping strategies. We also wanted to take a strengths-based approach and to build on the cultural resources that many of these families have. And so we talked a lot about culture and about family traditions and experiences and, and how they can help the family feel more connected. We, we developed this program so that approximately five or six families could participate in at once and so this allowed families to feel that they were part of a network of support, that they, f that they didn't feel alone, that they were um, around other people who had similar experiences. And then we also um, really tried to, inc to include as many fathers as possible. And this allows the, the mother to feel more supported in, their he in her healing process, as well as to um, help fathers understand their role in their families. Many immigrant fathers work multiple jobs and, and are less connected to uh, what happens in the family, and so this allowed them to really understand how important it is for them to be involved as the mother is um, recovering. And um, one aspect that I'd like to share with you about how we implemented this, we met weekly, but we always started with a meal, and because it's important for engagement, it's important for the families to start out in a positive manner. So we would sit around the table and all have a meal together. And what we found is that after the second session, families started bringing food. And it was their way to give back because they weren't paying for their service and, and they were so grateful for it that they would bring food and it almost became a competition for who could make the best tamales. Or, and, and, and for them to really show off that they did have strengths. And it's interesting, because I used to do similar work in, in Baltimore, and when I've talked to um, my colleagues in, at Johns Hopkins about this, they say, are you sure they were depressed? Because they were bringing food, and they were cooking, and all of that, and, and yes, the answer is yes, they were depressed, and these families also have a lot of resources and assets. In terms of impact, uh, one of the uh, what we found is that we did meet our goals. We were able to recruit families, to enroll them in the program. Um, most of them not only enrolled in the program, but they also completed the program, so they attended at least 10 of the 12 sessions, um, including fathers. 80% of fathers participated in the program. Um, we also found that in terms of clinical outcomes, that the women's levels of depression decreased. The children, um, they also had decreases in their behavior difficulties and emotional problems. And um, 
we were surprised to find that many of the fathers, when they started the intervention, also had relatively high rates of, or high levels of depression, and, and these uh, went significantly down um, after the intervention. And then um, we've also, in terms of impact, I'll show you impact on students. I'll show you this through two quotes. And one quote is by a student who is Latina, and she talks in her quote about how the intervention gave her a sense of purpose, how being in a, um, in a predominantly white institution, sometimes students, feel dis students of ethnic minority background feel disconnected, and this program allowed her to feel a sense of, of purpose and of giving back to her own community. And then the second quote is by a white student who makes a parallel between um, how in some ways we're all very similar and, we're, and also the program allowing her to see how privileged um, many of us are and how um, it's important to work to improve social justice. And just wanted to acknowledge my research team and um, John and Tasha, thank you for supporting this important work. And I hope that this is just the beginning of how we can begin to address the Wisconsin idea because we are very privileged in this environment, in this academic institution, to do the work that we want to do. But we really need to take to heart the responsibility we have to make a difference in the community surrounding our institution. Thank you. It just so smooth as silk, how you so consistently able to go from one to the other. Thank you for what you're doing here. So the first thing you might notice is that this is not the title in your program. And the reason it is not is because I have the incredible honor of being a recipient of two mortgage match proposals, and I promised Randy Waller that I would talk about both of them in 12 minutes. <laughs> Though I also should say that I have also the honor of being a recipient of community environmental scholars support from the Nelson Institute through the Mortgage Center, so it's really like three projects, but that would take 18 minutes. <laughs> so. You may also have humanity scholars in the room may also be groaning, oh, a tale of two projects. But this may not be as cliche as it actually seems. Because even if you haven't read the book, you know the opening line. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And the two projects I'm going to tell you about occur in the context of the worst of times one of the most dramatic economic collapses in our history, and the collapse of democracy in Wisconsin. And in these two contexts, there are groups working with both of those consequences. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about, along with, if you have read the book, you also know that it is about the challenges of trying to create the good society. And that's also what these two groups are trying to do. So the two groups I want to tell you about are Southwest Madison Community Organizers and Community Shares of Wisconsin. Southwest Madison Community Organizers is an informal group of residents in Southwest Madison. They come from about five neighborhoods on the Southwest side. And they have organized this group along with the assistance of two public health nurses, Kim Neuschel and Jessica LeClaire, who have been working there for a number of years, building up community relationships. Community Shares of Wisconsin is what a number of people describe as an alternative to the United Way. So they do workplace fundraising, just like the United Way does. The difference is that they are governed by their member organizations, and their member organizations are much more likely to be social change oriented. Now, with Southwest Madison Community Organizers, I had two community and environmental sociology capstone courses 
one in the spring of 2012, one in the fall of 2012, working with this group and with the group that they were supporting in one section of these neighborhoods. And with Community Shares of Wisconsin, I mean, we often talk about how undergraduates do this, but with Community Shares of Wisconsin, I had a PhD student who started off just doing a little project and course with them, then decided she really wanted to continue. Continued as a volunteer through a whole summer as a volunteer researcher. Then we got funding to support her as a research assistant. And then she kept continuing as a volunteer and she's also now doing her dissertation from this project. Now, these two groups, you know, when you think about Community Shares of Wisconsin, what Community Shares of Wisconsin really does is they raise money and they raise money to support their member organizations. Southwest Madison Community Organizers is really a grassroots community group that does things in their neighborhood. They uh, have helped redevelop one of the parks. They have done traffic safety improvements. Um, they have uh, these amazing community suppers where they bring 100 residents of different races, different classes together. And so we might say community shares supports change in Southwest Madison Community Organizers Swim Co creates change. Actually, though, the other thing that SWIMCO does is they support community organizations and community groups and even smaller community groups in the neighborhoods. And they then are a supporter by community shares. Community shares itself is also trying to change the funding scene in Madison. So they're actually engaged in, in organizing change themselves as too. So I, I don't want to make these two things so separate because actually when we work with SWIMCO, we work with them supporting another residence group. And when we worked with Community Shares, we worked with them on their direct change work. Now what, what was the how part of, of this? And, you know, and the, the other thing that, that I want to mention here is, you know, two classes of students working with SWIMCO. Uh, and you will, I guess, hear from Marion in, in a few minutes, but I want to recognize Marion Slaughter, who is in the room and helped work with that second capstone class. Ashley Ross, also supported by the Morgard Center, though outside of the match grant even, worked with the first capstone class. So, you know, I am I'm this incredible recipient of of riches to be able to do this kind of stuff. And so go down the Southwest Madison Community Organizers site. What happened is there's a small group of residents on Teresa Terrace, just one street in Southwest Madison, primarily renters, primarily African-American. And Southwest Madison's like a suburb. There ain't nothing around anywhere but houses. Uh, and these folks wanted some place for their kids, and they actually wanted some place for themselves. There was a, a vacant duplex, and they said that would make a great community center. What our students did was, was they sat down with them and, and helped them figure out what they needed to know to try and turn that into a community center. So the questions were, how do we reuse a building? And what do we want to put in it? So the first capstone class looked at zoning issues, code issues, accessibility issues. The second capstone class looked at what do residents really want in a building like that? What do kids really want in a building like that? And so we had students doing this document analysis, looking at all these zoning laws. We had them doing surveys. We used dot boards for issues. In fact, and one of the things that we did for quote unquote gathering data was one of these big community suppers. In this big community supper, we had dot boards for people to, to dot the issues they thought were important. We had surveys going around the room. Uh, and it was actually then easier than you'd think to collect the data because we had 100 people in the room and, and they were all like giving information. 
analyzing it was also easy because you count the number of dots on the board. So we're not talking high-end research here, but we're talking about research that these residents took to city council. And on February 26th, the Madison Common Council voted unanimously to buy that building for their community center. And they got it. I mean, we helped, but they're the ones who testified they're the ones who got city council to vote. On the community share side, they wanted to know how do we recruit organizations and how do we improve giving? And they had this amazing database of like, you know, every donation they, that they'd gotten and they anonymized it for us so they took all the names off. And what Catherine Willis did was she went through with them and actually developed a database that could be analyzable even after she was gone. It was not easy because the, there were actually two databases and they had to be reconciled and it, it was pretty challenging. And then analyzing it, it's like, okay, well, what if we analyze it this way or what do we analyze it that way? But in the end, what community shares got from this process was a set of possible things that they could try to increase fundraising. And they just literally conducted their own experiments. So they took some workplaces and did it one way, another group of workplaces did it another way. They actually did this without Catherine or I. They, did, they designed this themselves from the data that Catherine created. And they found out that the one that they did the changes in had increased the giving over the ones that they hadn't done the changes in. And so I, I just, well, this is the page of thank yous um, because we got graduate school funding uh, for Catherine Willis. We got Baldwin funding for the Southwest Madison work. Public health has been amazing. Uh, Swimco, Community <coughs> Shares, the Mortgage Center. Uh, I should also, you know, when you start doing this, it's like, oh gee, I forgot so and so. Um, and I also noticed on, on the program here, the Boys and Girls Club, without the Boys and Girls Club, that community supper that we did in Southwest Madison to collect that data could not have happened because they brought their game uh, to that community supper. Uh, and made that happen. And the last thing I want to say is that none of these grants pay for any of my time. And if it were not for my UW extension appointment and the support of my colleagues in the Department of Community and Environmental Sociology who say I should and can do this stuff, it wouldn't happen. Excuse me, a little bit of uh, organizing of our team. <clears throat> uh, I'm Boyd Rossing, a uh, Meredith professor, uh, retired four and a half years ago, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to speak to you today about a project the Mortgage Center obviously funded. Uh, the project is called Family Voices. Um, through this project, I've had uh, the privilege of working for over 10 years with um, families, African American families uh, in South Madison. Uh, incredibly enriching work um, for me and hopefully we've done some help for the families. <clears throat> um, in about the year 2002, uh, my department, Interdisciplinary Studies in the School of Human Ecology, made a, a big decision. We decided that we were gonna embark on a long-term process of really engaging in South Madison uh, and building relationships with African American families. Uh, over the course of uh, those years, I think we had some success. The initial approach we took was very open-ended. Uh, as some of the other speakers have pointed out, um, we utilized food, we had monthly gatherings, um, we had food at the gatherings, and we began to listen. And what we um, learned was that there were a host of issues and also many strengths in the community. But in particular, we found that education was um, 
coming forward over and over again as the number one issue. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we shifted then into uh, a phase that um, call the family school relationship phase. In, um, in that phase of our work, we worked with some of the local schools. Uh, we, create, we conducted some um, family school forums. We helped some of the local schools start a parent involvement day, which in some cases continues to the present day. Uh, and uh, at that point, we were learning more and more about what the needs of the families were. And so um, this led us to begin doing um, a yet further phase where we were able to build another bridge back to the university. And the bridge there was we began linking up our college students with children in a mentor tutoring relationship. Because what we discovered was the college students, and these are students of color, uh, most African American, felt very disconnected from the community. They were on campus all the time and busy and engaged in their studies and they had very little opportunity or vehicle if they were from out of state to connect with the um, local, fam uh, local community. So we um, started a Saturday uh, mentor tutoring program and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, a, a couple of years later in this process, we um, uh, entered into a really important partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we decided we needed for the long-term sustainability of this effort to, we had been operating pretty independently, to have um, a solid community partner. So we partnered with the Boys and Girls Club, and one of the, the fruits of that was we were then able to secure an AmeriCorps VISTA Saturday coordinator uh, from Wisconsin Campus Compact. So now I'd like to um, conclude my part by just saying a few things about the distinctive features of the mentor tutoring relationship that we create um, every Saturday at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, all persons of all backgrounds are welcome. We've had um, uh, mentor tutors of, of all ethnic and racial backgrounds, but we retain our distinctive focus on African-American families and children and connecting them with students of color. Um, our mentor tutors build vital relationships with the children uh, and based on that relationship, um, they're able then to help the children with their academic subjects and they try to follow the wishes of the parents because we engage parents in helping us know what they think is really important. We also engage parents and families in various ways through um, meetings and communication and so forth. Uh, and then at the end of the Saturday morning, we have a, um, uh, another one of our partners is Slow Food UW, and they prepare and create um, this wonderful brunch uh, using local foods that they've purchased um, prior to Saturday. So that's, a, that's a, a brief capsule of the history and the program. Now I want to introduce Marion Slaughter, who is a graduate student in the School of Education. And Marion taught the seminar, which was funded by our Mortgage Match Grant. <clears throat> Thank you, Boyd, and um, good afternoon, everyone. In 2012, um, Family Voices was awarded funding, including a mortgage match, to offer a professional development seminar to support the increased success of um, the UW Volunteer Mentor Tutors. There were four primary goals for this seminar, including improving mentor-tutor effectiveness and developing a deeper understanding of the complex realities um, of the families that they were serving. In order to achieve these goals, the seminar was developed as a space where the mentor-tutors, through activities like reflective journaling and problem-solving discussions, enhanced by readings and speakers, could creatively address um, sorry, uh, challenges encountered in their mentoring sessions. When asked about their experiences of the program and the seminar, mentor tutors reported developing positive habits of mind, such as patience, creativity, flexibility, open-mindedness, and a sensitivity to the different experiences of others. Finally, I would like to share an example of how the seminar enriched not only the mentor-mentee relationship and the Family Voices program in general, but also the larger Boys and Girls Club community. 
through brainstorming ideas to help a mentor promote his mentee's interest in geography. A seed was planted in the seminar students to develop an International Day event for all family voices, mentors, mentees, and their families, and the Boys and Girls Club members. This photograph captures a little of the excitement, learning, fun, and great food enjoyed at the event. This event continues at, to be offered by the Boys and Girls Club. Chloe Brown will now speak about Family Voices from a very unique position as a former mentee, a mentor tutor, and a participant in the seminar. Thank you, Marion. Um, again, my name is Chloe Brown, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I am a senior at UW-Madison, and I'm double major in legal studies and sociology, and I wanted to talk about my mentee as well as mentor tutor currently as an undergrad at UW-Madison. Um, as a mentee, I've had a lot of longevity with the program. Um, I s was a mentee in eighth grade, and I was there for two years. And then my brothers, who are now 19 and 14, um, are, were in the program as well in their middle school years. Um, I felt that it was very necessary for us all to be a part of that program because it really helped us understand the importance of academics on a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, the, when I got to undergrad, I knew I wanted to continue on being of service to everyone, um, and I got involved in my undergraduate career last year as a junior with Family Voices, and it was such a great opportunity to be a mentor tutor and give back to my community, especially since growing up in the Madison community for 21 years. Um, it was another opportunity to get to know students that I did not know um, who are in middle school and elementary school. And I had experience with Gaziah Bester. And her mother is actually in the back right now, Sherry Bester. And it was such a good experience just helping her with her homework and getting her ready to go to high school. And that was really important to me because I wanted to make sure that as she kept going through high school that she always knew she had someone as her backbone as well as her whole community as well. And I think it's very important as a student when you get here you're like oh where when can I how can I volunteer with doing all this extra work such as academic work and job related um, work and I really found a, a, um, peacefulness with volunteering and calmness I am an RA at um, in housing so that definitely was <laughs> appreciated on a Saturday morning and uh, it was it was a, it's been a great experience and as coming to the end of my undergrad career and just looking at how service related and going off to law school next, um, it's definitely fostered how campus and community relations is. So thank you. And now we will have Monique Bryson. Thank you, Chloe. Hi again, my name is Monique Bryson. I am a recent graduate of the community and nonprofit major in the School of Human Ecology, and I currently serve as the AmeriCorps VISTA for um, the Family Voices Project um, based at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, my role in this um, project is to continue the vision of Family Voices from the past to the present and sustained on to the future. Um, Boyd alluded to it, but um, historically, this project started off as a listening space um, for our families to voice their uh, issues with uh, their family or parent issues and also education issues. And one of the things that our program did was able to address those concerns about halfway through the decade of our service. And uh, we addressed it by developing a mentoring and tutoring program. Um, with this, um, we were able to focus more of our kids, but one of the things we lost kind of a small focus on our parents. So something that we do presently is continue to have parent um, weekly calls, having uh, parent, excuse me, parent surveys, and also um, a parent appreciation day that we'll be having in April. Um, something that Marion has facilitated the professional development um, mentor tutor seminar and also the match grant the match grant that funding that helped us realize that a major pillar of this program is um, reflection and one of the things like Chloe kind of alluded to as well we bring in our mentors presently at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday mornings um, to reflect on all the issues that they have maybe the last week help them how to engage with their students on homework tips specifically in English and math, and also to keep them socially engaged with each student one-on-one. -on -one. 
last but not least, um, as Chloe was, I was a mentor tutor as well. Um, and it is a, of great need to have these um, students on campus to come out of the campus bubble and actually go into real communities, especially South Madison, since it is just down Park Street. Um, and we're very fortunate and hopefully having these um, volunteers and these mentors to um, humble, have a humble experience coming down to the Boys and Cl Girls Club every Saturday morning and also realize how fortunate they are um, being um, undergrads and being um, on that campus and hopefully making that reality for all of our kids back at the Boys and Girls Club. With these three elements, we're hoping that the Family Voices program um, grows stronger and keep in the hearts and minds of all of our mentors, our mentees, all of our kids, and also our staff. And hopefully we can use our hands to keep building this uh, as a stronger program for it can be sustained for a very, very long time because it is very much needed. Um, I want to thank you for all who has participated and also who was in a stakeholders in this project and we uh, this includes our concludes our presentation and thank you once again well thank you everybody uh, Randy Carmen Paul Boyd Chloe, uh, Monique, and Marianne, that was wonderful. And what an amazing look into the worlds of these very dedicated scholars, students, and community members. And I want to have everybody come up on, on our uh, platform here. Come on, join us. Sorry we don't have enough uh, chairs. But uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for more questions. And I think we'll just do this as we did before with our roving mic. Uh, and let's open it up for questions from our panelists. Thanks. Um, this actually isn't a question, it's a comment. I think we heard some beautiful uh, examples of the impact of engaged scholarship concept, you know, in terms of the faculty, in terms of the university students, in terms of community. And I would just like to give testimony the impact on community organizations. Um, I've had the privilege of, right now, through the Farley Center, being connected with the We Badger volunteers, my role in Ally Drive uh, with Wisconsin Idea Fellowship students, medical students, We Can Serve volunteers, and it's just really, really important, I think, as a community organization to be able to stretch, you know, our limited resources from you know personnel, finances, and expertise by having these community academic partnerships. And I just really appreciate the Mortgage Center for really providing the leadership in this, this whole effort. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And I'll, I'll just reflect on that by saying that I think as we've observed today, there wasn't a single project that we heard from today or saw out in our poster session that didn't pull funds from a distributed source. There was no single funder for any of our projects, and I think that's very telling. This kind of work is challenging and difficult to do and very difficult to fund, so I think uh, the, all of the PIs deserve a lot of credit for being resourceful, but how much it means to have a source that we've had to help match these funds. So my question is for Family Voices. Um, I'm really impressed by the longevity of your project. Um, in Family Voices and your team. And I know a little bit about the history of your funding, but um, what did you do during your dry period to keep your project going? We, we've really had a, a long journey here from early um, strong support from the school uh, which enabled us to hire a half-time community coordinator uh, through some periods where we had no funding at all. Uh, and um, I think what, what we discovered is uh, if you're resourceful and if you're really committed and determined, uh, you can still keep your project going during those low periods. Uh, I give a lot of credit during um, one of those periods to our community coordinator, Stan Woodard, um, who is no longer funded 
uh, but he continued on Saturdays to hold the, um, the tutoring program because he believed it needed to stay there. It, he didn't want to see it go away. And subsequently, we were able to get some additional funding. Uh, but it's constantly a challenge because funders are looking for uh, immediate results or quick results, um, and they don't want to fund you indefinitely, usually. So you're looking for one round and then another round, and when you're doing the kind of work that we've been doing, which is um, quite difficult to measure in traditional ways, um, it is challenging. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge, but we've managed, I think, because the families, uh, the children, the students really want to see this happen, and so they, they find a way. Hello. Uh, two years ago, the Mortgage Center, the Red Cross, and the Urban League uh, engaged in a partnership to uh, have two blood drives that specifically focus on sickle cell disease to reach out to African Americans uh, and encourage African Americans to donate more blood. And I want to call out Chloe Brown, who is a member of our team Sickle Cell. She's an officer in the Wisconsin Black Student Union, and I just want to public publicly acknowledge your work on the committee, and thank you, Chloe. Hi, I have a question um, for the project with the depressed moms, and I'm wondering how you handled, or if you handled, or uh, the issues, I assume, maybe some of the same mental health issues in the young chit children uh, <clears throat> yes well this thank you for your question this was designed to be a prevention program in that we knew the mothers had depression and were in treatment for depression and we wanted to prevent children from developing mental health difficulties now of course when you're working in a highly stressed community uh, we found that some of the children of these parents already were experiencing difficulties <coughs> And so we, on the one hand, worked with them through our groups, through our weekly groups, in um, helping them understand how their um, expressions of distress are a product of the family, but also as well as their own coping. And, um, and then we also made referrals, appropriate referrals, if it really seemed like they needed more intensive, ongoing um, intervention. But in some of the work that we did, uh, when kids sometimes talked about their difficulties, they talked about how their difficulties really were more uh, uh, worry than anything else. So they were particularly worried about their mothers, about the safety of their mothers. And a lot of what they did, on the surface, it looks like a strength. So they would say, well, I cook for, my, I cook for the family every night because I love to cook. And then as you start delving deeper into the motivations behind what they do, you start to realize that they cook for the family because otherwise they're afraid nobody else will, as the mother sometimes very um, can be very isolated and very um, unable to really function in, in their parenting role. So we try to, when we talked about their mental health issues, we try to really contextualize a lot of their behavior as a response to them really caring for their family and really wanting their family to do well and how important it is for them to be part of this intervention. So, so we try to look at it not from a deficit perspective but also um, from a strengths perspective of everything they were doing to support their family. But we did, in some cases, we, we did um, make referrals. That's what we're hoping. What actually, what we're hoping to do in the next phase of this work is to train the local clinicians who, in this project, provided the referrals, to train them so that they can do this in their own clinics, which is a much more sustainable way of doing it, and that's how we've done it in Baltimore as well. In fact, in Baltimore, we started doing this work about 10 years ago, and there's one clinic that has continued to do the program um, with African-American women, in that case, um, over the years since then.
Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. It's still on the immigration policies because I think you have an extremely hard job because families divided because of our immigration and our uh, trying to break families apart. That if the husband's in it, in well, a, a real case where a husband, the wife was legal, the husband was illegal. He went back to get legal, which is impossible. Once you're in, in, in Mexico, there is no way to rationally get into this country legally anymore. Uh, so how, how can you force all of us to effectively help change the immigration laws? I'm asking a big <laughs> job of you, but I think you have a, a terrible case to handle with. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is, this is a real concern. And you know, some people might say, well, this doesn't really affect families in Wisconsin because Wisconsin is a more, um, what's called a, a, a safe haven state. Um, it doesn't affect them as much as other places like Arizona, for example, but this is on families' minds. In fact, um, I've worked with many families who, whose parents have talked to their children about what would happen if a parent doesn't come home from work. Because you just, you never know, it's a, it's a real possibility. And I think if you, if all of you want to make a difference in terms of bringing this issue to light, this is not an issue that affects immigrant families. I think some people think that it's just affecting families who shouldn't be here, they're not legally supposed to be here, therefore it doesn't affect me. But it does affect all of us because the more we force people into the shadows, to live in the shadows, the more we're creating a society that's uneducated, unhealthy, that's not able to participate civically, and that affects all of us. Not Exactly, it's, it's, and so, yes, there are so many, we can have a conversation for a couple of hours, but that might involve a bottle of wine. <laughs> a few more questions. This isn't quite an elevator speech question, but it's somewhat related. If you had one minute to speak with the new chancellor, Chancellor Blank, the governor of Wisconsin, Governor Walker, and the mayor of Madison, Paul Soglin, what would you tell those individuals with regard to the value and future of engaged scholarship? For anyone, or everyone. You stumped us. <laughs> I think we have lots of thoughts. I can do at least two of them. <laughs> um, to the chancellor, listen to the wisdom of the people because they have knowledge and wisdom too. Um, to the mayor, thank you for getting it. Um, I honestly do not know what I would say to the governor. I guess if there was one um, thing that I would say to the governor, um, well, that I can share here in public, <laughs> is, is to really listen to how other governors, um, like for example in the state of Maryland that is, um, currently has um, O'Malley, I believe is the name of the governor, um, who are very engaged in this type of work. And um, in that state, what the governor does is that goes to the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland and says, I wanna know how health reform, how immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, how it affects the citizens of our state, and I'm charging you to do this, and here are the funds for you to do this. And this is how I think other governors should, should follow suit, is really take advantage of the academic resources in their state to advance community engagement and to really improve the health of its individuals. So that would be the advice that I would give to the governor. I think for the chancellor, that was one of the people you mentioned, right? The chancellor, is the importance of community engaged scholarship. I think for so long we've been involved in this ivory tower of doing research that, that has long term 20 year, that it takes often 20 years to get to the communities that are intended for the research. And 
that's too late for the communities right now. And so we really need more recognition of this type of work. And even though it sounds like this is in community engaged research is considered more in tenure cases, I don't think it's considered enough. And then I've always been told as I've done this type of work is don't do that because you're not gonna make tenure. The more time you spend in the community, the less likely you are to have publications and to make tenure. So I've had to do it in spite of, um, or I've done it in spite of many people encouraging me not to do it. But it, that's a reflection of just the, the system. I'd like to talk to the governor, and <laughs> in, a, in a good way. I, I think that the governor has spoken explicitly on the power and importance of science and innovation and priorities around the university, which go hand in hand with that, around some of the terrific things that go on in engineering and the life sciences here. And I think what I'm learning from community uh, environmental scholarship, the, our program, and the kinds of innovations that one of which I've mentioned, you know, turning uh, very, fairly dirty industry around in a really interesting way, that those innovations will be catalyzed by people, by the people, and through relationships that, are ca uh, that move through and are catalyzed themselves by the university. So the science and engineering and capital value added that's gonna flow out of Wisconsin institutions and out of the next generation of, of young people uh, will be about those sciences and that kind of learning uh, in the community and from the community, and that they'll, he'll get what he wants but only if it comes out of this, this organic set of relationships. And th I would argue that that is a win-win and that, uh, that every party can come to the table around that, I would hope. That's what I'd say. Looks like there's four of us in the elevator. <coughs> um, I think uh, my message to all three would um, be the same, but maybe with a little different emphasis. Um, it would, the, the Number one, it would be, look, let's, let's be honest here. We've got some huge issues facing our society and facing our globe, really big issues. Um, and yes, we have our differences about our politics. Um, but one of the things that we consistently fail to do is really bring the diverse people to the table that have some real knowledge to bear who have to be part of the solution. And I would say that to all three I think to um, Governor Walker, I would probably say um, you're very concerned about bringing the private sector forward and reducing the barriers of government and so on, but I would say the private sector has to be more than business. It's got to be the families, it's got to be the youth, it's got to be diverse voices. Um, that's part of that private sector outside of government um, which you're speaking about. Uh, I think to, um, to uh, the Chancellor, I would talk more about knowledge. Um, I think the university has um, um, sort of the monopoly on knowledge or thinks it does, um, and that's part of our problem dealing with issues. I would really try to stress that uh, while the knowledge that's been developed at universities is outstanding, um, for the issues today, as I said before, we have to have voices of people that live the issues because they have a really important knowledge. And for, for Mayor Sagan, I'd probably say, you know, basically, um, I think you've, you've had a history of doing a lot of these things. But um, as I always say to myself, I want to go deeper and grow and expand and, and look where I can do more. So I would just challenge him not to sort of sit back and think he knows it all because um, you never do. <coughs> Thank you. And do we have a, a perspective from a student? Could we add to the mix? <laughs> I'll put you one of you guys on the spot here. <laughs> Elevator speech. Or you can go together if you want. That's, I don't want to make you guys uncomfortable. It, it, it would be wonderful to hear well, a, a thought. You watch. <laughs> they just can't decide who's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um. So for Governor Walker, um, I'll just start off with him. I feel that he, there needs to be, I, my question is um, how concerned are you with the families that are in Wisconsin? Um, I feel that we only touch base on certain issues, but that's forgetting a whole, a bunch of other communities that still live in Wisconsin. 
um, to the chance, the new chancellor. I guess my question is, is uh, how, what is her opinion on diversity and is it important to the um, University of Wisconsin-Madison? And then for the mayor, I've lived in Madison my whole life, so um, I guess that question would be, how do you continue to further on your mission to make sure that families are a priority in Madison, Wisconsin? Well, I think that's probably a great question to close on. Wonderful question, and thank you for asking that. We have wonderful perspectives. And let me just take this opportunity again to let us thank all of these speakers, the students and the uh, faculty. And again, 